Friends, welcome to the sixth choral contemplation event of this term. We go back in time. The year is 1890, and although Calcutta was the capital of pre-independence India, British administrators in charge of running the subcontinent from Delhi had a cobra problem. You know, the reptiles. The city was infested with these venomous cobras, and the government thinks of what it thought at the time was an ingenious plan to offer a bounty for every dead cobra, and they thought this would turn every local Indian into Her Majesty's cobra hunters. The strategy worked for a bit, but then enterprising Indians started breeding cobras for income. Once the government at the time realized what was happening, it scrapped the bounty. Seeing no value in breeding cobras, the locals set the innocent reptiles free, leading to an increase in the population of the venomous cobras in the city. This, my friends, is not very different to our emotions. We are sometimes chasing happiness so sincerely that we forget of the unintended and undesirable consequences arising as a result of this sincere pursuit. Unfortunately, we all understand the pervasive incentives, and yet we can't seem to escape the vicious cycle. Well, we hope that our program for today would help you understand just that, that is, appreciate the role of spirituality in communities. Our guest speaker of the day is the Tai Chi Qigong teacher, Hannah Pak, who, was, who first reached out to me with the idea of starting a new course for Tai Chi before the start of this academic year. We offered some taster classes in Hillary whilst I was on furlough, and in Trinity, we started our weekly sessions here in the chapel. Different departments of the college have used the same program and found it to be very useful to many students. Now, I know that we offer meditation and sometimes also yoga through the chapel, so it's not as if we are offering competing techniques, but rather complementary methods of achieving the same goals. What I personally felt was unique about Tai Chi was that it's a movement-based mindfulness technique. The best way to describe this is perhaps to share a personal experience from just this past Tuesday. I was in a weekly meditation class where the teacher taught us a new technique, mindfulness, but with an uncomfortable twist that truly raised my level of self-awareness. So the class started with a 25-minute meditation session. I, I was sitting here in the chapel. And then the teacher asked us to get up at the end of the 25 minutes and start walking around in circles in this confined space. Now, given my past experience with another technique, I was walking slowly in a concentrated way, rather serious. But the teacher asked, us, asked me to speed up and walk much faster. She was giving regular instructions. My mind was perturbed. What? No, this is not supposed to happen. I'm in a concentrated state of mind. I'm supposed to be listening to my own instructions. And then she asked us to sit back down and meditate for another period of 25 minutes. That was difficult. I was first annoyed by my concentration being broken by instructions, the act of walking in a confined space. I was more used to longer periods of uninterrupted concentration. Then I was upset at, my, at the inability of my mind to refocus on the task at hand, which was to forget about everything else and just concentrate on the breath. It was perhaps the most difficult session I've had in a while. But once the cloud of unhappiness was lifted, I had a spark of self-realization. This is what you've missed so far. You've been working on concentration, but your real weakness is your inability to re-engage your mind after a disturbance. This is not dissimilar to what Hannah teaches, her, teaches us and the college in her Tai Chi lessons, which is how do you go about co coordinating your mind and body at the same time? And what better way to enhance a spirit of communal harmony than working to attain a state of equanimity for just ourselves together? Now, I very much look forward to what Hannah has to say about Tai Chi, but as always, accompanying her talk are relevant readings and music from a college choir. The first reading, read by a director of chapel music, is, a, is from a 6th century BC philosopher, Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu's text, Tao Te Ching. It roughly translates to the way of integrity. Whilst we've only chosen a small portion of the text, it aims to deliver a means to live in the world with goodness and integrity. One of the pieces the choral performed today is Turn Back, O Man, composed by Gustav Holst. He was the music master at St. Paul's Girls' School in Hammersmith and the music director at Morley College until his death, which was in addition to his surprising interest in Hindu literature and Sanskrit language. The second piece, A Hymn to Christ, is composed by Imogen Holtz. 
We hope you enjoy our program for today. Please sit back and enjoy. An extract from Chapter 2, Tao Te Ching, by Lao Tzu. When people see some things as beautiful, other things become ugly. When people see some things as good, other things become bad. Being and non-being create each other. Difficult and easy support each other. Long and short define each other. High and low depend on each other. Before and after follow each other. Therefore, the master acts without doing anything and teaches without saying anything. 
Things arise and she lets them come. Things disappear and she lets them go. She has but doesn't possess, acts but doesn't expect. When her work is done, she forgets it. That is why it lasts forever.
This is a reading from A Path with Heart by Jack Kornfield, who's a, an American author and Buddhist teacher. Much of spiritual life is our growing ability to give. It is wise to look at whatever spiritual practice and teacher we wish to join from the perspective of what we can offer. In spiritual life, what finally makes us happy is not what we get, but what we can give. What we can give to a community and what we can give of ourselves. We give of ourselves when we give up our old views, our fears, our limitations, the barriers that we have held for a long time, and discover a fundamental and radically new way of being. We give to a community when we give of our energy, our creativity, our heart to the whole. There is an immense joy that arises in a greater purpose. To give of our own spirit, to serve, is a wonderful and fulfilling part of joining a spiritual community. This giving and receiving heart, this honoring of the sacred, creates the spirit of Sangha, of a spiritual community. The community is created not when people come together in the name of religion, but when they come together bringing honesty, respect, and kindness to support an awakening of the sacred. True community arises when we can speak in accord with truth and compassion. This sense of spiritual community is a wondrous part of what heals and transforms us on our path. I don't know about you, but for me, there are three things that have come to define my experience of lockdown over this past year. The first, a development of virtual communities through the likes of Zoom or Teams comes with its own set of pros and cons. The most obvious being the greatly expanded global communities which have formed out of the greater accessibility of events for so many people, versus the inevitable trade-off of Zoom fatigue. The second is a newfound or deeper appreciation of nature. The past year of lockdown has seen many people rediscovering the joys of being outside, of coming to recognize what a vital resource it is and just how much benefit we can derive from cultivating a sense of connection with the natural world. The third, perhaps seemingly in contrast to the second, is that many of us have become more sedentary. This is almost unavoidable when you lose your daily cycling commute in working from home, when your local gyms are closed for months on end and government restrictions limit how much time you can spend outside of the house or who you can see. Of course, it's perfectly possible to work out at home or go for a daily walk or cycle ride. However, even with restrictions lifting, many of us have still struggled to find the motivation to be more active on our own, even though we know how important it is for our health and well-being. I have some theories about why this might be. But first, where does spiritual community fit into this? Even with all of the aforementioned benefits the virtual world offers, we've still seen a falling off of attendance of virtual classes, or a lack of enthusiasm, even reservations, at the prospect of doing virtual Tai Chi or online yoga. It's true that some activities translate much better online than others especially ones which require the following of physical movements. But even so, after a year, my own initial enjoyment of my meditation group's weekly Zoom classes has started to lose its appeal. Why? What is being lost here? Not to denigrate the impressive sense of virtual community fostered by Oxford Insight Meditation, or for that matter, Somerville College, but there's really no denying that meeting online just doesn't provide the same sense of community and connection you get when meeting in person. Opportunities for organic catching up after a class, 
of spontaneous conversation with long-missed friends and acquaintances are too often lost in the virtual world of large groups of people all talking over each other or pre-organised breakout rooms. As for people struggling to find the motivation to be more active in the isolation of their own homes, we don't really have to look very far for an explanation. Research shows that exercising with others, having a gym buddy or joining a regular exercise class is far more motivating than exercising alone. And people embarking on such communal programs are much more likely to stick at it. Again, why? What exactly does the communal experience give us which is so hard to replicate on our own? And how does this relate to more spiritual or contemplative activities such as meditation or Tai Chi? On the face of it, we know that we're fundamentally social animals, so it's not hard to see how harnessing the sociable element of human nature could be a powerful tool for motivating and inspiring people to reach their personal goals. But there's more to it than the fact that people enjoy socialising. Paul Gilbert, in his book The Compassionate Mind, describes the results of his research into what people found most helpful when joining the communal weight loss programme Slimming World. Most participants also mention the sense of support, community and family they received from sharing in their groups. They identify these as being key in helping them get through the difficult times, including some quite obvious depressive episodes. Time and time again, we come back to this experience of being able to get through difficulties in life if we feel understood, supported and cared about by others. It seems then that a key part of what makes having a community so supportive, whether it be in trying to lose weight, exercise, or practice something like meditation, is the sense of empathy and solidarity it provides. And perhaps most importantly, that sense of connection to something bigger, something which takes us out of ourselves and reminds us that we're not alone in our times of struggle. Paul Gilbert calls this common humanity seeing one's experiences as part of the human condition rather than as personal, isolating and shaming. To put it another way, what makes it so reassuring for us to know that we're not alone, particularly when we're finding something difficult, is that it enables us to reframe our difficulties. If other people are also struggling with the same things that we do, we can see that our struggles are not the result of some sort of personal defect or weakness, something fundamentally wrong with us, but merely a feature of our human nature, or what Gilbert calls our shared programming. Far from undermining the intensity or reality of what someone is experiencing, everyone suffers, you're not special, get over it, knowing that others also feel and suffer as we do can actually help us to take ourselves less personally and stop blaming ourselves for what we are feeling about a given situation or assuming that we ought to be feeling otherwise. Such insights underpin the practice of mindfulness and, along with consciously cultivating kinder ways of relating to ourselves, are absolutely key to liberating ourselves from mental distress caused by that all too human tendency to judge and criticize what we're feeling from moment to moment. Instead, we learn to hold our feelings more lightly, allowing them the space to shift and change without defining ourselves by them. This reminder that we are neither alone nor defective through the sharing of our experiences with others is what helps to take us out of ourselves, preventing self-absorption or solipsism, and instead encouraging that deeper sense of connection. And it's not just connection with others we seek out, but connection with the natural world too. I mentioned at the start of this talk how this year of lockdown has driven so many people outside to listen to birdsong and smell the flowers. How this time spent in nature has become an escape and a lifeline. This instinctive response to the isolation of lockdown indicates a great human need to feel connected to the world around us and a growing recognition of just how important this is for our well-being. This sense of connection with other people in the natural world lies at the very heart of contemplative practices like mindfulness, Tai Chi, and Qigong. When we come together to practice with shared presence and intention, we first connect more deeply with our own bodily sensations, and then we start to experience the gradual quietening of the mind, and with it, our sense of separation slowly drops away. 
in embarking on the practice together, in repeating the same forms and movements in synchrony as a group, an atmosphere of stillness and harmony emerges, and something beautiful is created. We become more than just our own practice. Now we're part of each other's practice too, and they are a part of ours in turn. This is why in Tai Chi we have the symbol of the yin-yang. It serves in part as a reminder of our interconnectedness as a community, the myriad ways in which our lives are interwoven with those of others. In practicing together, we can encourage and support each other to continue our own individual practice, and in deepening our individual practice, we have more to bring to the group. And so we can see the interplay of self and other, just as the yin-yang represents the interplay of other opposites, stillness and movement, expansion and contraction, separation and connection. In each case, you cannot know one except by its opposite. In order to experience a sense of connection, we must have a sense of what it is to be separate or disconnected, and vice versa. And so we see how these opposites are both dependent on and integral parts of each other. Similarly, cultivating a sense of what Gilbert calls common humanity or communal connection can change how we relate to ourselves as individuals, encouraging us to be kinder to ourselves and less judgmental. This kindness we learn to show ourselves can in turn influence how we relate to others in our communities. And so we start to see how inseparable these things really are. To nurture the self is to nurture others, and to care for others is ultimately to care for the self. This emphasis on interconnectedness goes against the grain of the rampant individualism so common in our society today. But it is a central feature of contemplative traditions like Tai Chi, and increasingly appealing for people leading ever busier and more compartmentalized lives. By joining a class, they're joining a community of like-minded people who share similar values and intentions, who are experiencing similar stresses in their lives and who may therefore be driven by very similar motivations. In practicing together, they are reminded of this simple truth, that we don't have to go it alone and that we are part of something bigger than ourselves on this path through life. To quote the Buddha, admirable friendship, Admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie is actually the whole of the spiritual life. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, next week, we will return with a special version of Choral Contemplation event in celebration of the Pride Month. We would have our college's principal making the opening remarks. We would have readers from the JCR, MCR, and different members of the college. Actually, anyone from the college is invited to attend. Details will be sent out very soon by an email. Please do tune in next week. Thank you.